Well, good Sunday morning to everyone. If you would stand with me as we begin the song service this morning. Song 368, as we stand, song 368. We have a story to tell to the nations. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses this morning. Song 368. All together there on the first. We have a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and sweetness, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light, for the darkness shall turn to dark. Song 377, Set My Soul Afire, Lord, Set My Soul Afire. We'll sing all three verses here. Song 377.
take that for granted, do we? The uh, birth of a, a new little one. So good to see you all here today and uh, have gotten to uh, to meet a couple of uh, people that are visiting today, but I see uh, others that are here <clears throat> uh, maybe for the first time. So if, if you're here for the first time, uh, if you don't, if we haven't already given you the uh, information about uh, our church, a brochure and a guest card, uh, if uh, when that is brought to you later, if you would just uh, take that and it comes with a, a pen and the pen is yours to keep. And we can guarantee you that uh, like most church pens, it'll last you through the rest of the day. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. That's what we're shooting for. And uh, if, it, if it runs out of ink before you get home, then just put it uh, somewhere where you can see it in the name of our church. And. Uh, or uh, if you live out of town, you can take it with you. And, and every time you see that pen, you don't pick it up to use it. You pick it up and remember to pray for us. So that that'll be uh, that'll be the deal uh, there. But uh, appreciate you visiting with us uh, today. It is our privilege to have the Merlot family, our missionaries to Argentina, uh, with us today. And and it's always a blessing to uh, to get to meet. Uh, those that are serving the Lord in other parts of uh, the country and other parts of the world. Amen. And uh, we are so thankful that they are, uh, they are here today. And you'll see Brother David here in just a, a moment, uh, and he'll bring the message today. But uh, Mrs. Emmy, if you don't mind, would you, would you wave at uh, everybody just one more time? There's, there's Brother David's wife, Miss Emmy, and so appreciate her being here. And they have... Uh, five children in uh, other parts of the building today and <clears throat> if you if you did not get a prayer card I would encourage you to uh, to take uh, the time and and look at their uh, uh, look at their uh, table out there in the in the uh, foyer and <clears throat> uh, talk to them about that and I've seen several of you already uh, doing that today but 
Uh, in, in my growing up uh, years as a, as a child, and even today, if you were to come over and, and look at our refrigerator, it'll have some of these. Uh, missionary prayer cards. Because yeah. I don't think that you can ever pray for a missionary too much. Uh, Brother David, I don't think that's possible, is it, to pray for a missionary too much? And I tell you, as a, uh, as a parent, it teaches your children to have a heart for their missionaries, for what they're doing around the world, and really, even past that, have a heart for the souls of people around the world. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to get a prayer card uh, there. Uh, uh, the Merlots already know what they look like. So they don't need a stack of these on their, on their table. Right. Uh, they already know that. So they need you to remember them. And, and Brother David, I'm going to do what you said in, uh, in Sunday school. Every time I uh, go to the store, just so that I'll remember you. That's the only reason. Just so I remember you, I'm going to buy me a package of peanut M&Ms. <laughs> and every time I come home with one or I'm walking around eating a package of uh, uh, peanut M&M's, and Shanna says, you have another package? See, I'm continuing to pray for the Merlots. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm, and uh, that, uh, that, that was just some good advice. I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, deacons and trustees, let me uh, mention something to you. If I didn't get to uh, tell you in person already this morning, uh, deacons and trustees meeting at 515 uh, this evening, 515. Uh, and we've got a business meeting coming up on Wednesday, be our uh, uh, yearly election of officers uh, business meeting. So wanted to give you a heads up about, uh, about that. Some of you might be wondering, why in the world does the bulletin say, congratulations, graduates? Wasn't that back in May? Yeah, but if you remember May, we weren't here when they graduated high school. Uh, so uh, last week is when I, when I actually meant to uh, put the announcement in here, but uh, I uh, uh, forgot about that, so I apologize. But uh, two uh, of your teenagers, part of your church family, two of the teens graduated this past May from high school. And uh, so looking at uh, uh, the future in the fall. So be in prayer for them, if you will. Let's look at our memory verse for today. As we continue uh, looking at uh, this month, uh, the right walk. Uh, the right walk <clears throat> and our memory verse dealing with that again today. Let's say it. Uh, twice through this morning. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5, 8. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Ephesians 5.8. Very good. <clears throat> uh, I will mention this. And uh, we uh, have sign-up sheets out in the foyer for uh, the couples retreat now. So uh, we need to begin signing up for the couples retreat. I know it's in October, but we, uh, we start signing up now for that. Also, a uh, ladies' meeting over in, in uh, Glasgow at Temple Baptist there. Uh, uh, in September, uh, ladies. So uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that, and also uh, there for the men's camp out as well. Let's uh, let's have another word of prayer. We prayed in Sunday school for God to bless the offering uh, this morning during the, all, the Sunday school time, and uh, now let's uh, pray that God will bless the offering uh, that is given today uh, towards His work. So Stephen, good to see you here. Glad that you're. Uh, here and and got Ray with you today. All right, good. Is he in here? Oh my goodness! Well, hey, we got to take a break. Just a second. There we go. All right. Yeah. 
And, and if you've seen baby pictures, he looks just like Stephen. Without the beard, he looks just like <laughs> Stephen. So, good. Uh, I'm glad, glad to see you all, and glad little Raven is, uh, is here. So, wonderful. Uh, Brother Stephen, actually, I was going to call on you to pray for the offering, but uh, sorry. Have you up and down, up and down. All right, thank you, sir. Let's join Brother Andrew and sing it. Stand with me once again. Song 380. Song 380. Revive us again. Song 380. Stand our hearts this morning. We praise the old God for the Son of Shall be 
song. Appreciate that. Learning to lean. And uh, we would be a whole lot better off, wouldn't we, if we would just learn to lean like, uh, like we should uh, upon Jesus. He can provide for us in uh, any way we need. In any part of our life, he can, he can take care of us and lean upon him. So ladies, I appreciate the message and song. <clears throat> Uh, this morning, I've already mentioned that uh, the Merlots are with us, our missionaries to Argentina. And uh, Brother Merlo brought a, a great Sunday school lesson this morning. Amen. And uh, just challenging us uh, once again in our missions uh, outreach and even in our faith promise. And I appreciate that very much. And looking forward to what God has for us this morning in the main service. And uh, I pray that you are too. 
And uh, just have your heart open and receptive to what God has for Amen. us today Amen. through his word. So, Brother David, come right ahead, sir. Appreciate you being here. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning again. It is uh, great to be here this morning with y'all. And what a great group here this morning. I uh, appreciate the attention in Sunday school. Pastor already introduced my wife, but I'm going to introduce her again. So this is my lovely wife, Emmy, born and raised in Argentina. So if you've never seen an Argentine lady, now you have. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure thankful for the, the wife the Lord gave me. You know, we couldn't do the work God called us to do without a faithful wife. And I thank the Lord for my wife and what she does. Um, so I mentioned this morning in the Sunday school lesson, I mentioned about Ezekiel and Berlin uh, getting saved and about baptizing them, about marrying them. But what I didn't mention is that um, Berlin's parents, we had never met them till last year. Her uh, dad, he's pretty intimidating. Um, just to look at him, he's kind of a tough guy. And uh, last year he had a stroke and was in the hospital. And that's the first time I met him. And I uh, was able to go up to the hospital, pray with him, met with uh, his, his friend's mom as well. And uh, slowly they began to open up a little bit, you could say. But even when Ben and Ezekiel got married, they weren't planning on attending the, the wedding. Just because it was at the church and they kind of don't want to have much to do with church. But at the last minute they decided that they would come. And so they came to the wedding. And he actually walked her down the, the aisle. He wasn't going to walk her down the aisle. But that just really gave us an opportunity to, to open up to him and show love to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he saw that we weren't like most churches. Um, we cared for people. We cared for him. And um, doing this whole uh, COVID, you know, a lot of time to think. And Belen has been witnessing to her parents more and more. And I'm not for sure if they've actually made a profession of faith or not yet, but they have begun joining our Zoom app. And so they're attending our services via Zoom Amen. and they're wanting to get their life right. Um, they're wanting to get married. Um, her mom and dad are not married. And on our Zoom app one day, he said he, in tears, he's like, I asked her to marry me and she said yes. So he shared it with the whole church. And so that's just exciting, you know. You see uh, uh, a young lady trying to win her mom and dad to the Lord, and they're wanting to come to church. In fact, they can't wait till we start meeting so they can actually come in person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you Amen. there Amen. again, because sometimes you can wonder, why do we give to missions? Uh, you know, uh, what does the missionary do? You give to missions so people like them can come to know the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> And I want to say thank you again for uh, giving two, two missions. All right, well, let's go ahead and stand and open up our Bibles to the book of Luke in chapter number 10. Once again, thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. I count it a great privilege, a great honor. Thank you, ladies, for the wonderful special. That was just a real blessing. While you're turning, I got to pick again on the missionary that's working with me. So if you heard in Sunday school the mistake he made saying he was a millionaire and he came to destroy churches, well, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, uh, I began letting him preach on Wednesday nights, trying to help him get used to uh, thinking in Spanish, preparing sermons in Spanish. And I figured if he's going to mess up, Wednesday night is the best night because there's not that many people there. And so uh, he was doing good and he was trying to say that we're pilgrims here on the earth. And so pilgrims is, uh, you call them peregrinos. Well, he got confused and he used the word pinguinos. So instead of saying we're pilgrims, he said we're penguins <laughs> here on the earth. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, I could go on just one more. He was trying to talk about the waves of the sea, you know, and how Peter, when he was walking on water, he saw the waves of the sea, and he, he got scared, and that's why he began to sink. And so the word for waves is olas. Well, he used the word oshas. So 
So ollas means pots and pans. <laughs> so Peter saw the pot and pans of the sea and he began to sink. Thankfully, our people are real forgiving. Um, so uh, anyways, all right, well, let's get to uh, Luke. <laughs> Luke in chapter number 10 and verse 25, and we'll read down to verse 37. <clears throat> And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength. Sounds like a familiar verse, huh? And with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Amen. So this morning we're going to try to answer the question, Who is our neighbor? Mm -hmm. Who's my neighbor? Who's your neighbor? Let's go ahead and pray. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house. And Lord, it's been good. It's been good to sing praises to your name. And Lord, it's been good to fellowship. And Lord, it's been good to listen to the special music sung by the ladies. And Lord, we all need to learn more how to lean on you, Lord. And what, what a great song. And thank you for that. Lord, now we do pray that you would... Bless this Sunday school hour, or this uh, service, and Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, and Lord, may we not just hear a message today, but may your Holy Spirit meet with us, and Lord, may we, may we be challenged to do what your word commands us to do, and it's in your name we do pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> To help us understand what is going on here, we have a lawyer that comes before Jesus, and really the whole story is a debate, not a debate, but Jesus telling the lawyer how he can have eternal life. Now, that's the question of the lawyer. He came to Jesus and he asked him the question of how can one have eternal life? That was a question of debate back then, and it's still a question of much debate today. Depending on who you ask, you'll get different answers. Mm -hmm. Some will tell you that you can have eternal life by being baptized. Some will tell you that you can have eternal life by attending church on a regular basis. Some will tell you you can have eternal life by helping out the elderly or helping out the poor. Some will tell you that you can't really know how you can be saved. You just got to try and live a good life and hope that when you die that Jesus will allow you to come into heaven. And so this is a very good question. And this lawyer comes to him with this question 
but his question was, was bad intentions. He didn't come because he really wanted to have eternal life. He, he came to try and put Jesus in a corner, so to speak, or to try and, and trap Jesus and try and see what Jesus was going to say. And Jesus knew this very well. So he turns the table around, so to speak, and he comes back with a question. What is written in the law? Well, you're a lawyer. You're a man that knows what the law says. Why don't you tell me what the law says? So now as Jesus turns the table, I can just see this guy kind of boasting and getting excited and maybe with a smile on his face and poking out his chest and shoulders really broad. And he's like, okay. And he begins to tell Jesus what's written in the law. And he begins to tell him here in verse 27 that we're to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all our strength and mind and neighbor as himself. And so... Jesus, in fact, says, good job. Kind of like patting him on the back so I can see his ego getting really big. But we need to understand something that Jesus didn't ask him this question because the law saves. But he asked him this question because when we look into the law, it shows us our need to be saved. The law doesn't save anybody. But you just following a, a set of rules doesn't make you a saved person. But what it does do is when you look into the law of God, it helps you see that you're a sinner. It helps you see that you desperately need forgiveness of your sin. And that in your own strengths and in your own merits, there is nothing you can do to get to heaven. So when we look into the law, it reveals our sinful condition. In fact, Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Mm -hmm. And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Right. So, the lawyer answers the question right, but Jesus said there's more to it than mm -hmm. just that. He says, love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus in verse 28 says, thou hast answered right this do and thou shalt live. Do what the law says. But he wasn't willing to do what the law says. So now he's going to try to justify himself. And it says, okay, Jesus, you tell me. Who is my neighbor? Who is the person that I'm supposed to love? Why don't you give me an example or tell me who my neighbor is? So then Jesus goes into the account of the Good Samaritan, which we all know, and he's going to show very clearly who the neighbor is. So let's go into our account, if we would. Verse number 30. And Jesus answering said, Here we go. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. So, Jesus said there's a certain man. Who is a certain man? This certain man is a Jewish man. And the Bible helps us by telling us he's descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, I've never descended from Jerusalem to Jericho, but I've ascended from Jericho to Jerusalem. And it's not an easy hike. <laughs> Thankfully, I was in a bus. But every time we would get up a little bit higher, the bus had to work harder and harder. And at one point, you're wondering if you're even going to make, make it to the top. And thankfully, we did. But this man is descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. The Bible doesn't give us uh, specifics on why. But we know a few things about this. This road was a very busy road. We know that it was used in the Old Testament. We know that it was used in the New Testament by Jesus himself doing his earthly ministry. Um, we know that it was a very dangerous road. It, it wasn't just an easy travel. As you know, any time you're going up a mountain or coming down a mountain, it's dangerous. And there's a lot of curves and it's easy to go off the side. And so they have all these signs to be careful, be careful, uh, you know, because you don't want to go. So there's a lot of places, too, for people to hide. Perfect campground for someone that is interesting in doing evil. Stealing, robbing, beating someone. And that's what happens here in our passage. 
It says, Jew fell among thieves. They didn't only fall among the thieves. These thieves, said, it says, stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, it's no fun when you're robbed. I don't know if anybody's been robbed or not, but I have. As a boy, one Sunday morning, I was walking to church in Argentina, and I had on a Dallas Cowboy jacket. Any Dallas Cowboy fans? Hey. Good, a couple of you are brave, huh? Dallas Cowboy jacket. And I was proud of my Cowboy jacket. It was one of the things I had from the States to represent I was an American, you know. And I'm walking to church on a Sunday morning, and there's a, a bush on the right-hand side. And you got to understand, Sunday mornings is dead. You hardly see anybody. And out of the blue, these two thieves jumped out of the bush. One of them grabbed me and put my hands behind my back. And the other one punched my brother in the face. And then he turned around and pulled a knife on me. You know what he wanted? My Dallas Cowboy jacket. Well, sure, I'm not that fanatic, you know. I... <laughs> so I'm like, yes, take the jacket. So I gave them the jacket, and they ran off. But I can remember my heart was just beating and, and pounding, and I was frightened, and I was worried. And Man, they didn't even do anything to me but take my jacket. Well, here, the Bible says that this Jewish man was beaten so bad, it says they stripped him of his raiment. They didn't only take his jacket. They, they completely took everything off of him. They, they took all of his goods, and they left him in a condition to half dead. Now, this half dead simply means this. It is a condition that without medical assistance, he will die. So he's beating pretty bad. You kind of get the picture lying there, uh, helpless, can't move, can't do anything for himself, bloody, in the heat. you got to understand, this would have been in the desert, and so it would have been a very hot place. And here he is, lying there, probably not even conscious or aware of what's going on, and pretty much just sitting there waiting for the birds to eat him or to die. That's his condition. Not a pretty sight. But in verse 31, Jesus says, And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to understand who the priest was. It helps us just to understand the story. He was a Jew. The man lying there is also a Jew. The priest was a very religious man. He spent a, a good amount of time in the tabernacle. He would have been someone that understood what the law said. He knew what the law said. He knew, in fact, that if you went back to the Old Testament, he was to help out a fellow brethren's animal that was in need. So he had a responsibility to help someone in need. That that is who the priest was. He understood the law, but he failed to apply the law. He had a head knowledge of what the law said, but when it came down to putting the law into action, he didn't want to apply it. Now, we could speculate and we could think of all kinds of different reasons why he didn't help. Maybe he didn't like the sight of blood. Maybe he was too busy and in a, in a hurry. Maybe he knew this fellow Jew and, and, and maybe they had some crossings. There's all kinds of things we could think of. But whatever it was, he did not apply the law. Someone who you would expect to do what the law says. Right, right. The Bible even says that he saw him. So he saw his condition half dead, but did nothing about it. Then it goes on and it tells us about another man, the Levite. Look at verse 32. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. This one even went a step farther. The priest, the Bible just says, saw him. The Levite actually says, came 
So that means he probably, if he was walking, he probably got off the side of the road to look at him. Or if he was riding a beast, uh, like we'll see in a minute, the, the Samaritan, then he got off his beast probably, and he came and he looked on him. Now, now, you and me would think, man, if I see someone and I look upon them and I see that they're in a condition where they need help, I would want to help them. Now, we need to understand, too, the Levite would have been just under the priest. He, too, would have known what the law said. He, too, would have spent an incredible amount of time in the tabernacle. He, too, would have been a Jew. So here you have two Jews, two men that were spiritual leaders of the day that had a responsibility to help those in need. And we don't know why, but they failed to apply the law. That makes me pretty mad. That, that probably makes you mad. And we look at this, this passage and we know it. And we can say, I can't believe the priest did that. This would have been a man that I looked up to. This would have been a, a religious leader. And he failed to do what he said. Oh, and now the priest or the Levite, he did the same thing. I just can't believe those two. But before you get too mad at the Levite and the priest... Let me remind you that we pass by people every day that are half dead. We pass by people, why like, they may not be bleeding, and they may not be lying there on the side of the road, but spiritually they are half dead. They're just the breath away. Without some spiritual assistance, they will die, and they will spend eternity in a place called hell. Hey, we work with them. We play with them. We go on vacation with these people. The people that live in our neighborhood, whom we would trust, and who we might see. Hey, hey, would you watch my home for me while I'm gone? These are people that we know, people that we come in contact with on a daily basis that they're spiritually half dead. But you and me do the same thing. We pass by them and we look upon them and we fail to apply the law. Oh, yes, the Bible says love thy neighbor as thyself. But we forget, hey, this means you're telling them about Jesus. Right, right. This means helping them, assisting them in coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we get mad when we come to these two people. Frustrated. Frustrated. Mm -hmm. But thankfully the story doesn't end there. Mm -hmm. Verse 33. Is the guy we all like. <laughs> He's the Samaritan. But a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed came where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. Stop right there. Who's the Samaritan? Well, he wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. Right. He was the enemy of the Jew. He, they didn't get along. They wouldn't be someone you would expect to help out a Jew. You might expect him to finish off the Jew right there. John 4, 9 helps us understand this. It says, Then sayest the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. They, they didn't have connections. They didn't help out one another. They didn't like one another. So if anybody wasn't going to help out this uh, Jew, we would say, well, it would have been the Samaritan. I mean, it's their enemy. You might look at it like this. Maybe it's that neighbor that doesn't like you or you don't like because they keep up their music loud on Saturday night and they party or they, they keep your block dirty because they don't pick up the trash and it's that person you don't like. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be the, the, the Jew for the Samaritan and the Samaritan for the Jew. They didn't like each other. Right. But whatever the case, the Bible says that when the Samaritan saw him, he had compassion on him. Right. He, he had compassion. He saw his spirit, his need, his physical need, and he was moved with compassion that led him to action. It led him to do three things. Now, I need a helper. And I've already asked uh, one of the young people to help me. Can you help me? So this is going to be my helper. He doesn't know what I'm going to do, so that's probably a good thing. Okay, I'm going to need you down here. I'm going to have him right here in the middle so everybody can see him. I'm just going to scoot this over a little bit. Would you mind just lying right here for me? Okay, actually, could you lie a little bit farther? Maybe at an angle. Yeah, so your feet over here. Okay, I'm going to 
and I can walk around. Okay. So picture here that he's half dead. He's going to represent the Jew. And he's beaten pretty bad, and he's bloody, and by this time, maybe a couple hours have gone by. And so he's without hope, pretty much, unless someone comes by and shows compassion on him. So we already saw the priest. He saw him. We already the Levite came and looked at him. And he's still there in the condition. So now I'm the Samaritan, and I'm coming on my trip, and I'm enjoying my trip. And all of a sudden, I see someone lying there. And as I get closer, I begin to see blood. And, and this is going to lead me to have compassion on him because I see his condition. So I get him, and I come over here, and I see him. And I say, hey, man, well, this is not good. Hey, and he's not responding. Hey, and man, as I get close, I can tell that time is running short, but I'm not worried about my time, so I'm willing to sacrifice my time, and so I'm going to go back to my beast. And I come back to my beast, and I grab my oil, and I grab my wine, and I grab my bandages, and I come over here, and man, I see him, and I begin to pour on in the oil and the wine on all his cuts, and I'm beginning to bandage him, and man, over here, oh man, this isn't good. And I'm over here and I'm working as fast as I can. And so now, not only that, but we have to do something. It's not going to help him just to have bandages and wine on him. Something needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So my compassion led me to sacrifice of my time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to lead me to sacrifice of my goods. I already sacrificed my time by coming to him. I sacrificed him my goods by bringing in the oil and by bringing in the wine and my bandages. But now we need to do something else. So the Bible says that he puts him on his beast. Now, have you ever thought about that? To put someone on their beast, a grown man. So I'm going to try to put him on my beast. A beast, we don't know what it could have been. A camel, a donkey. We don't know, but it was an animal. So I'm, I'm here, and then he's all sweaty, and he's all bloody. <coughs> Man, you're heavier than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to lose my compassion. <laughs> I might need to take off the joke. Go. <laughs> oh, well, okay, you can help. <laughs> Man, I think I need to go to the hospital. <laughs> okay, thank you. So it wasn't like just, oh yeah, let's just pick up this guy and load him on my beast. I mean, this was sacrifice of time. It took a lot of work to get this guy on his beast. I picked the skinny guy. <laughs> What I got this guy was a rich Jew, a healthy Jew. So we see that his compassion, it wasn't just words. His compassion led him to action, and he was willing to sacrifice of his time. The next verse shows us even more about his time. 34 at the end says, and brought him to an end and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, stop right there, he spent the night with him. Right, right. So he could have been in a hurry too. He could have had a business deal going on. But whatever it was, his compassion led him to action, the sacrifice of his time to put him on his beast, to take him to the end. And the sacrifice of his time and spend the night with a stranger. His compassion led him to sacrifice of his goods. Hey, he still had a trip that he had to take. He, he might have run into some thieves himself. Something might have happened to his, to his beast. And he might have needed that oil and wine and bandages. But he was willing to sacrifice. Yes, good. Right. Verse 35. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence mm -hmm. and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever I spend this more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Mm -hmm. He sacrificed financially. Uh -huh. Well, two pence doesn't sound like much. What was it? Two pennies? Two dollars? Would have been two days worth of, of wages. Mm -hmm. 
So if you make $100 a day, that would have been $200. If you make $1,000 a day, that would have been $2,000. So he was willing to give these two pens to the innkeeper. And not only that, he went beyond the call of duty. And he says, hey, listen, I'm going to be coming back through this area. And if you need more, don't hesitate to tell me because my compassion is leading me to action. And I want to sacrifice of my, of my finances so that this guy can come to know or can come and get better and see his family again. Hey, my friend, this is what missions is all about. When we have compassion on the lost, we see their need. We see that they're half dead. We see that they're going to need someone to point them to Jesus Christ. And we'll be willing to sacrifice of our time we won't look at it as oh boy here we go again we got to go out soul winning i hope it's quick i got one hour and that's all i'm gonna do mm -hmm. we won't look at uh, being uh, involved in a disciple discipleship class with someone as being a hindrance or oh here we go again time we'll be happy we can invest time in someone because we see their need We'll be happy to sacrifice of our goods so that they can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. We'll be happy to sacrifice of our finances so that the whole world, hey, you got to remember the Great Commission is not just here in Bowling Green. It's the whole world can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Yeah. It won't become an issue when we have compassion. Oh, I just can't give to the to missions. It's just such a sacrifice right now. But yeah, there's a lot of other things that you do. <laughs> Without going into detail, I think we all can think of ways that we spend our money that we can not spend it in that area. Sure, right. Oh no, I can't give whatever amount God placed in my heart to do. Uh -uh. Whether it's $5 or $500 or whatever, you fill in the blank. But so many times we get excuses on why we can't give to God. Why we can't give the mission. Uh -uh. It's just too much of a sacrifice in the time we're living in. No, the times are so unstable right now with this COVID-19 going on. I just don't think I can give. But yet you still keep all the luxuries that you've always been doing. And you're still doing all the fun things. And you're still going out to eat and doing all these other things. But we can't sacrifice you know the law, but you fail to apply the law. Mm -hmm. You know the law says love thy neighbor as thyself, yeah. but you don't want to apply the law. So in reality, we're no better than the priest and the Levite. That's right. Right. Come on, man. Oh, we can come to church and we can say we love the lost and we can tell, tell the preacher we love the lost and we can, we can make it sound like we're some superhero Christian and that we're super spiritual. But I'm not concerned about words. I'm concerned about action. Because mm -hmm. we can all talk. Mm -hmm. Yes. But this Samaritan led him to sacrifice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of his time, of his goods, and of his finances. Mm -hmm. Notice verse 36. Which now, Jesus is going to ask the lawyer this question. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Well, the question is pretty obvious. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Do what? Don't only have an understanding about what the law says. Put it into action. The law says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Do it. The law says we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Do it. The law says that we're saved by faith and not by works. Do it. The law says if we confess our, with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. 
The law says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The law says the only way to see the Father that is in heaven is through Jesus Christ. So we can go on and on about what the law says, but it don't do us any good to have a head knowledge of the law. What he's trying to get across is apply the law to our lives. We need to put the law into action. Hey, and if we're going to talk about missions, that's exactly what loving our neighbor is. It's putting the law in action, going forth and taking the gospel to them, going to every nation. And as we mentioned in Sunday school, you do this by being messengers and by getting involved in Facebook promised missions. So God don't only want you to know what to do. He wants you to start doing it. Amen. You may be here this morning and you're like the Jew. You're in a condition right now that you're spiritually half dead. If you were to die today you know that you would not go to heaven. You know that you're trusting in your own works. You know that you're trusting in some kind of um, religious activity that you did or in a baptism or in something else besides the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what the law says. You know that you need to repent of your sins. You know that you need to humble yourself and call upon Him as Lord and Savior. But your pride is getting in the way. And, and, and while you know what the law says, you're not wanting to apply it this morning. And I would encourage you before service ends or before you walk out of this church, you need to get that right and you need to apply the law to your life so that you too can go to heaven when you die. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you are saved and you know what the law says and you know you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're real honest, you're not doing it like you ought to be. And if you're real honest, you're not be willing to sacrifice so that others can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Everything is like, oh, here we go again. And everything is like you're doing it just because you have to, but your spirit is all wrong. And maybe you need to get involved today. And maybe you need to look at it as not just a sacrifice because, oh, it's so hard. But a sacrifice and something eternal. Something that's going to last in a soul being saved. And that's why we can report to you this morning. And say there's several people in Argentina that have been saved. Because many have sacrificed. Yeah. But some are not. Some, they know what they ought to do. But they don't want to apply it. Kind of be like this. And I'm done. So the Carson, Pastor Carson, would be the priest. Now everyone looks up to Pastor Carson as a spiritual leader. Just like they would have to the priest. And he would be someone that you would expect to do what the law says. So here you are, you're sick. You're not half dead, but you feel half. And you broke a foot and at the hospital, you got your foot up like this, and you're miserable, they're not feeding you very well. And here comes Brother Pastor Carson. And you began to get a little bit of hope and excitement because your pastor's coming to visit you, and he walks up to the room and he says, Ooh, this stinks in here. And then he looks over there and he sees your food and he's like, Man, I'm glad I'm not eating that stuff. And then he pulls out a double bacon cheeseburger from Sonic. <laughs> and he begins to eat it right there in front of you. Well, this is a lot better than that. And then his phone rings and he looks at it and like, oh, I got to go. Something's wrong at the church. And so he leaves. Never prayed with you. Never really asked you how you were doing. Never showed any concern about you. How would you feel? Pretty, pretty bad. Man, he's my pastor, and he gets up there every week, and he preaches, and he's the one that I would expect to be an example. Okay? So you're kind of frustrated. And then you're kind of thinking about it, and Brother Decker comes by. Brother Decker's going to represent the, the Levite. He, too, would be someone that knows what the law says. I mean, he travels, and he preaches, and you're like, Definitely Brother Decker. I've always liked Brother Decker. And Brother Decker comes in and he walks in. Man, you sure don't look good. <laughs> Man, I can't believe they got you cooped up in this room. You don't even want you open up the blinds. And this is miserable in here. And then he's texted. And, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, man. 
I forgot. I gotta go play golf in 15 minutes. I'll see you later. I don't know if he likes golf. I'm just making this up. And so out goes Brother Decker, and there you are still lying there in this miserable condition. And in your mind, you're thinking, that's it. You know, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm definitely not going back to that church. You know, and then Brother Andrew comes along. I think everybody likes the youth pastor, right? And Brother Andrew comes along, and you're like, it's the greatest Brother Andrew. He's more concerned about the teens than he is me. He's never going to help me. And here comes Brother Andrew, and man, just a smile on his face, and he walks in, and he grabs your hand, and he's like, man, I'm so sorry you're going through this. You know, I just want to let you know I've been praying for you. And do you need anything? Can I help you? Well, can, can I just take a minute or two and read you a few psalms and pray with you and then your face just gets all lit up. Brother Andrew showed compassion. Now, many times we know what the law says and we don't do it. It's not just Pastor and Brother Decker that know what the law says. We all know the law. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't like it if they knew what the law says and they didn't show compassion on you. Well, how about your neighbors? Mm-hmm. They know you go to church. Sure. They know that you say you're saved. They know where you are this morning. And yet they're wondering when you're going to show compassion on them. Mm-hmm. When are you going to talk to me about mm-hmm. church? When are you going to show me about this stuff that you say is real to you? And they're waiting on you to not only know what the law says, but to put the law So I challenge you this morning, as we looked into this, to look deep inside and ask yourself, am I applying the law to my life? Am I willing to sacrifice of my time, of my goods, and of my finances so that my neighbor, not only here, but my neighbor that I've never even met around the world, is able to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love. Lord, I love the story of the Good Samaritan. So many times we just read it because we know it and we don't really pay attention that much. Lord, I pray you help me to be like the Samaritan. Show compassion even on my enemy. And that person that I may not like. And that person that may not be the friendliest, may not have the best education, may not have what I'm expecting them to have. But Lord, there's still a person that needs you. That person that doesn't even speak my language in another country. That person that lives life totally different than me. But I can sacrifice of my time or of my finances so that they too can know about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone in here could go back to when they got saved. And they can think of someone that was willing to sacrifice. And they're very thankful for that person. Now, Lord, help us to do the same so that others can come to know you as Lord and Savior. Bless this invitation. In your name I pray. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God has spoken to you this morning as the music plays. Respond to him. Maybe you are giving your mission. Maybe you are giving your time. You're just giving the bare minimum. You're just giving enough just to ease your conscience. But you're not really doing it so that you can, because you're really concerned about the lost. But you're just doing it so nobody says anything to you. Well, examine your heart this morning. 
Maybe you're not involved at all. Maybe you're like the priest and you see people and you're like, oh, I'm not going to go talk to them. Do you see the neighborhood they live in? Do you see the car they drive? Uh-uh, I'm leaving that for someone else. Mm -mm. We need more Samaritans. As the Lord speaks to you, you respond during this time. sacrifice that's just an uncomfortable word isn't it because it means we're putting something off that we want or we desire we put it off for the good of something else or someone else in this case but are we willing to sacrifice another question is am I willing to do what I know to do I know it, but am I doing it? Am I willing to do it? The third question I was asking myself is, am I willing to show mercy on my neighbor? It's easy not to show mercy, isn't it? We were using the example of a neighbor that's playing their music real loud and it's annoying you. Maybe you come up with about 10 different ways that you could bring an end to that noise. And not one of them was show mercy. It's easy to come up with other options. But are we showing mercy? Not always easy to do, but how many times do people show mercy to us? More importantly, how many times has God show mercy to us? Ask yourself those questions. Am I willing to do what I know to do? Am I showing mercy? Am I willing to sacrifice? Great song for invitation. God gave everything for us. Are we willing to sacrifice for Him for the sake of others? Let's sing that next stanza. I suffered much for the
Thank you for the message. The yeah, I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. Great uh, illustration. I got to take him to the chiropractor this afternoon uh, so he can come back and preach tonight. I almost got up and helped you, but I was the uh, Levite, so I couldn't do that. I knew my place was to sit right there and not move. So, uh, all right. Uh, Look forward to you all being back tonight and to the message this evening as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, what God uh, gives us through his word again tonight. And Brother Merlo, if you and your wife would uh, uh, be there in the foyer, you can go at this moment if you'd like. Uh, that way uh, folks can get to meet you uh, up close and in person. If they happen to fall down, do not try to pick them up. <laughs> or invite others to help you. That, that might work. All right. <clears throat> Little is much for the closing chorus. All right, great. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll close with that chorus. Brother Brian Carpenter, would you pray for us, please, sir? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've heard today. and pray that you'll continue to bless your word and help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'll be with each one that's here.